after the storm comes the calm, and with it, the grief. Come here, Perlo, we've got work to do. There you go, you've seen a man with one broken sword. But have you ever seen a man with two? Caught him two broken swords? <laughs> I've been waiting years for this moment, old man. Hello, hello everyone. Today we'll be exploring Cold Harbor to tell all the stories not told in the original video. We will uncover the secrets of Molak Ball's broken land and correct some mistakes of the past along the way. Disclaimers. Throughout this video you will notice that the subtitles don't match the voice acting perfectly all the time. In fact, they can be quite different at times. When this happens, you should always go for the subtitles, as they are a lot newer and a lot more polished than the voice acting. But I have noticed that they are never terribly dissimilar. It's just that the details sometimes feel a bit off. There are a lot of smaller stories in Cold Harbor, and a lot of even smaller details one can observe inside this area, and I will mention like 95% of them, but there are some extremely small, really not worth mentioning stuff that I will just leave as is. A witch trying to cure the Thracian plague and a woman selling skeleton horses are immersive characters, but they never come up again and if anything they just provide some flavor to the realm, so they won't be mentioned here. Also, the Vincent Trilogy universe is an expansive one, and many characters require context provided by the two other mods to be understood. Looking at you, Junal. So, when we're talking about these characters, I will mention their stories up to and until the point of Vigilant. Don't expect Junars or Orlandos or even the Bard's full identity and purpose explained here. Here we will talk about these characters only within the context of Vigilant. I know, I know, everyone wants a video explaining the sequels, and trust me, I wanna make one too. Content would have never been freer, but Glenn Moriel is unfinished, and they are both on voice actor, and even the translations can sometimes be interesting, to say the least. Don't worry, we'll get back to some of these characters later. Or someone else will. This Kalpa is crawling with terrible entities, and I have been opening a lot of strange doors lately. I fear that one of these doors might contain something that I wasn't meant to see. Anyway, back to video games. I want to thank Ailar and her many many reddit posts in advance for helping me make this video. When it comes to videos like this, I usually prefer them to be my own home cooks, but given the exceptionally esoteric nature of Vincent's mods, I needed some help with this one. So for that I want to say thank you. The link to the Owl Archives Discord will be in the description. On another note, I will also be skipping some books that solely exist to hang out the other two mods. We will also come back to these books later on as well. Don't you worry, this video isn't short on in-game literature, that is for sure. And finally, it is with a heavy heart that I must say that the epilogue of Vigilant will not be explained in this video. However, by the end of this video, the Sacred Anodomancer will be explained up to a point where the epilogue will make a lot more sense. Okay, final warning for spoilers out of the way, and let us enter Molak Boss Realm one last time and tell the stories from Cold Harbor. We shall begin the story exactly where the last one left off, with Molak Ball's plan foiled, the Bard free from the Endless Stream, Lemay finally at peace, and the Dragon Break over. So, in case you don't remember, the reason why Molak Ball was so quick to pack his bags and leave Cold Harbor was because Jigolak was invading his realm and was only barred entry from the Imperial City because a barrier part by Maruk was preventing him from starting the Grey March and because of a curse placed by Molak Ball. But when we kill Maruk, the grey march began, but we didn't see Jigalag anywhere. We only saw Laza, who, if you remember, was the only nomad that survived Lemay's attack. Well, after the end of the main quest, Jigalag's infinite army stops looking like an army of perfect order and begins to resemble more of an army of perfect disorder, as they spawn randomly across the map in giant crystals with no ability to form cohesive attacks or a full-on assault. Their great intelligence seems to be gone. Even Bishop Arazil, who kept observing them, is completely puzzled by this. It's odd. They're making no effort to march to the city. Compared to their previous march, they're completely disorganized. They act like broken Dwemer automatons. They don't even get hostile unless you approach them. So, what gives? Well, if we enter the Cocoon of Order and fight our way through it, we enter Jigolak's throne room. Jigolak is stagnant. He's sitting on his throne, unable to move, and if we get closer to him, we can see why. He's got a sword pierced through him, Laza's sword. Here we can free him and fight him for ourselves. And before you all say that this is the second time the Dragonborn beats up a Daedra, this isn't the Jigolak that fought the other princess of Oblivion and almost won. This is a weakened, betrayed, stabbed, realmless Jigolak who is currently in the process of invading another realm. This is not him in his prime days. Also, he's missing his beacon of order which allows him to command his infinite army. Laza took it from him. So if Laza hates Jigolak so much that he's willing to betray him moments before his victory, why did he join him? Well, the answer should be obvious. He hates Molak Ball even more than Jigalak. He hates Molak Ball so much that he was willing to team up with a homeless Daedra to steer him towards invading Cold Harbor just so he can take his revenge. But what he didn't account 
was for the Dragomon to be there. Okay, but this seems like a bit of a convoluted plan for a vengeful Noma to come up with. And this is what I come in to tell you, that he wasn't the one who came up with this plan. All around Cold Harbor are books relating to the characters we see in the realm, three of whom talk about Laza's journey after Lemay's attack. I'm only gonna talk about the one where he encounters the White Owl, because it says, Laza met the White Owl on the Green Meadow. The Owl stared at Laza's weeping eyes and told him, a shepherd may become a wolf if he lays down his staff, and he may roam the forest and hunt down his prey. A wolf may become the wind if he abandons his fangs, and then there is no place out of reach for him, and so he may eventually reach those he lost, but the wind may not blow straight. If you become the wind of order, your fangs will grow back and you will be a wolf again. So this is how Laza got the idea to team up and betray Jigalak, and with all that in mind, Jigalag is still not out of the picture. Yes, he has been weakened, but his army is still roaming Cold Harbor, his cocoon is still standing outside the Imperial City, and when he's healed and gets back on his feet, the Grey March will continue. And Molak Paul isn't exactly in a position to oppose him either. Oh, yeah. Damn. Damn, boy. Damn, boy, he's sick! Bah! We will talk a lot more about Laza and his encounters with the two other owls in videos to come, but just know that Laza isn't a minor character, he is essential to the plot of these mods. I bet after that all of you are wondering who the owls are, but I'm not gonna talk about them now. We won't be explaining the owls in detail in this video, but keep them in mind, every now and again they will be rearing their ugly head. Now I want to talk about my favorite stories inside Cold Harbor, beginning with my absolute favorite, the story of Mary. No, not the Mary from Pelanor's vision, well... Well, we'll get to her too, but here I want to talk about a different Mary. Well, it's complicated, but in reference to the Mary from Pelno's good ending, I want to remind everyone that before dying peacefully in his good ending, Pelno freed Mary from her imprisonment under Rumelodian Feather and sent her away with his dog, which he tasked with guarding her. Okay, different Mary now. I shall now read the book, Judgment. Why did we, the Elysian Order, condemn the follower of Mara who cured the boy infected with the Thrasher Plague to death on the pyre? Why did we hang the boy who was saved from his illness? And why did the Archmage Sarah Bane, who treated the plague with the warlock's ring, escape his death on the pyre. We have explained this many times already. The crux of the matter lies in whether they did all this with the permission of the Order. Unfortunately, the follower of Mara sought no permission for her work, hence why she was sentenced to death on the pyre. In addition, the boy who was saved by the same unauthorized miracle, no, heresy, died for the same reason. Did not the masses willingly gather firewood for the follower of Mara, and were they not too happy to throw stones at the boy standing in the gallows? This collective act of citizens is the most decisive proof of the righteousness of the Elysian Order. As for the treatment of the Archmage Saravain, his usage of the Warlock's Ring, which we recognize as a relic of Saint Elysia, for the treatment has been approved by the Elysian Order, and will be subject to no further questions. So there was a follower of Mara called Mary, who healed the child without the permission of the Elysian Order, and for that, both her and the child she cured were burned on the pyre and and beheaded respectively. It also mentions that there is a group of Mara worshippers that do not ask for the permission of the Elysian Order, and given the monotheistic doctrines of the Order, following Mara would probably be opposed, with fire. We can meet these followers in a cave called the Secret Cave of Mara's Worshippers. In it, we find Executioner's I mean, Maram. We can find Maram the Slaughterer. In his inventory, we can find this note. The persecution of our members has only gotten worse after Mary's execution. Why did Mary heal that boy with the thrash and plague in the middle of the square? It was clear that the Elysians wouldn't allow that. Lady Mara, what am I supposed to do? I heard a voice. It must be the voice of Lady Mara herself. Tomorrow morning, I will lead the rest of our faithful to storm the Imperial City. I will gladly bring down the hammer on the Elysian Order. The morning is here. I've never waited for the sunrise so impatiently before. Lady Mara, today we will show you our love with a pilgrimage of blood. Please watch over us. Watch us drown the Elysian Order in their own blood. Deep in the cave we can find another noteworthy follower of Mara, Arya the Whisperer. I'm not gonna show you too much of her because she's topless, but she was cursed with becoming a half-spider. And who cursed her? The note on her inventory reads as follows. After the pilgrimage of blood, my legs are getting covered with strange sores and hot scales. Lady Mara, why is this happening to me? Have we not shown you our love with our pilgrimage of blood? Have we not done as you told us? That pilgrimage was too terrible to be called your love. Many innocents drowned in blood and the walls of the Imperial City were painted red with it. But that is what you wanted. Did you not tell us that even death is divine love? Lady Mara, I don't understand. I don't understand anything anymore. What do you want from us? Yeah, to be honest, I don't know what Mara could possibly want from them either. Uh, gods work in mysterious ways, I guess. Okay, so a few more notes about Mary's character before we really learn what happened to her. Outside, there is a statue devoted to her with a sign that says, Healer Mary of Mara, Plague, a rod with the Elysian Order, burned on the pyre. Also, I want to remind people what Pepe had to say about Mary. You must have seen people infested with the leeches on your way here. Whatever remains of them, ends up here. Some call them Mary's children. The Elysians burned her on the pyre for, supposedly, being a witch. Some say she consorted with the Morlag Ball and gave birth to those monsters. Mara. 
the name of one of Anuiel's damned usurpers. Here I want to make a distinction between the two diseases that existed in the Imperial City during this time. Thrash and Plague, a slowed crawled his way into the Imperial City through the sewers, and he was genuinely friendly, but he was ugly AF. And the people really didn't like Sloats because, you know, necromancy and disease magic and mind control. And so they thought, no, no, Sloat no good, and they killed him. But before he died, he spit a disease to a bunch of them, which would go on to become the Thrashian Plague. A Sloat. A Sloat crept into the sewer. He was a good lad, but he was too ugly to be accepted. And Alicians killed him because of his ugliness. Just before his death, the Sload spat some kind of liquid at the one surrounding him. This is how the Thrashing Plague started. Mary's children. After Mary was imprisoned but before her execution, some say that she made a deal with Molak Paul to give birth to leeches who would torment her executioners and the people who saw her burning the pyre on that day. Now Mary's a boss we can find in the sewers, and outside her dwelling we can find Sir Caius. Yes, that Caius, from the Knights of the Nine. Oh, did I mention that all the Knights of the Nine are here? Because they are. And? Atima. Who's Atima? Atima is called Atima. It is a nice name, no? Do you know anything about Mary? She is a priestess of Mara from the time of the Alessian Empire. Apparently, she was a healer who could cure the Thracian Plague. But there are very few records of her left. All I know is that she was burned as a witch by the Alessian Order during the outbreak of the Thracian Plague. What can you tell me about the leech monsters? They are former humans, twisted by the Thracian Plague and Mary's blessing. They rot again and again until they lose their human form. And behold. This is what has become of the noble healer Mary. When we take her out of her misery, we get this dream. Are you... Are you Mara? To appear in the image of Alicia? Are you mocking us? If we say anything while Pepe is talking here, he gets mad and says this. Silence! Be quiet, witch. You may have fooled the masses, but I cannot be deceived. We will burn you tomorrow morning. We will burn you as a witch, a heretic to Saint Alicia. But, of course, you probably already know this. For you to come to such an end, Mara. Regrettable. Now this is what actually happened, and notice how Molak Paul calls her Mara instead of Mary. And this is what happens when we don't provoke Pepe's anormous ego, and just let him talk on and on. Good. Stay silent. You have no right to speak as it is. Why in oblivion would you interfere with us now? Don't you know what will happen to you tomorrow? I was not informed who you are, and I don't care whether you truly are her, or just her imitation. But tomorrow... You will be condemned and burned in the pyre. And those kissing your feet today will throw you on the fire tomorrow at my mere's jester. Are you aware of this? Yes, I think you are. Look at the stone. Can you turn the stone into bread? Of course not. How could you? Man shall not live by bread alone. Weren't those your words? And as the Bishazar's will, a Daedra rose up against you in the name of this bread. It can't have escaped you how the masses followed this Daedra in droves. Mundus is full of the starving, and it was them, shouting for bread and salvation, who tore down your tower. I'm sure you intended to raise a new one, but it's useless. You will not complete even the foundations of the Tower of Fate. If you had not tried to build a tower, you might have been able to alleviate the suffering of the people, but you did not. And what did the people do? They came to us, the Elysian Order, crying that the ones who promised to steal the heart of Shazar lie to them. If you truly are Mara, then accept the stone. Then its fires will fade, and this abominable tragedy will end. But you will not accept it. For one who denies the miracle, also denies the Aedra. People would rather believe in the miracles than in the Aedra. So much so, that they even create their own miracles. 
and would soon believe even an inquisitor like me. But neither your love nor their free will is important. Just this mystery, this stone. Even if every last living being has to betray their consciousness, they must submit to this stone. At least you know it was created for this. So we had to rewrite your teachings. We built our tower on top of miracles, mystery, and authority. We released people from this freedom, this free will, which can only bring them endless pain. And so, with the permission of the Elysian Order, we were compassionate to the weak, even despite their sins. Is this not proof of our love for the people? This stone is our authority and earn, and we will never give it up. Even if we have to renounce you and worship a simple slave queen. Already, two thousand years pass since the Imga Prophet found the stone in the dense jungles of Colovia. The tower has been waiting completion since then, but sooner or later, it will be completed. And then, everyone will live in bliss. You could have united everyone, masters and servants alike. Perhaps you couldn't do it, but we, the Elysian Order, can. With this stone, we will build a great empire spanning across the entire continent. With this stone in our hands, our empire does not have to wait for the return of Shazar. What I said will happen, and our empire will rise. And tomorrow, you will see the people flock to us, like the obedient sheep they are. At my side, they will willingly place firewood at your feet. And do you know why? Because you tried to stop us. If there is anyone in Mundus who deserves to be burned on the pyre, uh, then it is you. T tomorrow, you will die. Th th then it, it will finally be over. Go! Go! Don't come back! Never come back! Never! Never! I cannot stress this enough. Pepe just lost an argument with the voices in his head and no one else. If we look at the cell right next to us, uh, Shiogoroth? How many gods are in this random prison again? And we go outside where we see Palano's dog still waiting for us after all these years. Okay, so you probably have a bunch of questions in your head right now. After the stone of the White Gold Tower was lost, and by stone I mean the Amulet of Kings, the Elysians sought to create a new stone and give rise to the tower once more with the fake stone that was given to Maruk by Molak Paul while he was puppeteering Elysia's body in the desert. But the bigger question you're all probably wondering is, what is the deal with Mary? She can have lived for 2000 years after the events of Pelennor's March, and she acted in a way which everyone, even her fellow Mara followers, knew that it would end up with either her getting in prison or killed by the Elysians. It is surprising to me that we managed to get this far without mentioning any of the Christian influences behind Vigilant. Crosses everywhere people getting crucified, names that correlate to biblical names, titles like Inquisitor, Bishop, Pope, phrases like turn this bread into stone, men shall not live by bread alone. We even enter Cold Harbor with a quote from Dante's Inferno, if we don't go with the Orlando option that is. It is better to abandon all hope. Even in obscure ways, in Joseph's mansion, we can find a banner of the Gnostic Demiurge, OG of the channel by the way, which reads, Sinking Sun, Missing Main, Laughing Moon. The following is a theory of mine based on these observations, but I think I got it right with this one. Mary is a aspect of Mara, a avatar of the real deity with the same abilities, beliefs, and hopes, but is only part of the oversoul that makes up Mara. Think of it kind of like Shazar and Shazarin, they have the same identity to an extent, and share the same goal, which is saving and preserving the world, and as an added bonus hating elves. This is further supported by the fact that Mora House, more on him later, who is a son of kind who according to the Nordic retelling is the widow of Shor slash Shazar, never referred to Pelennor, who is a confirmed Shazarin, as father, instead calling him uncle. I think this is a similar case right here. Mary is an avatar of Mara, and she wants what Mara would want, which is the redemption of people through love. If Pelennor had listened to her, he could have had a good death instead of being stuck slaughtering people in Cold Harbor, and if Pepe had listened to her, he would have not end up like this. A miserable fool roaming Cold Harbor is only a husk of his former self, constantly trauma dumping about how Shazar hasn't come to save him, in front of a Shazarin. There is an obvious nod to the fact that she kinda resembles Jesus in a way, they both performed miracles and were criticized for it, and they were both sent with the purpose of redeeming people. But in this case, the people are doomed to their own flaws. Oh boy, I sure hope people in the comments don't tell me that I am wrong in every single way possible. That would be a first on the channel, would it be Belharza? Where did I go wrong? When I burned Mary? Or killed that Shalod? Or when I met Marak? In the jungles of Colovia. Everything is gone now and I don't know anymore. Pepe after causing two plagues after throwing the world in a dark age because an ape gave him a glowy stone in the middle of the jungle be like, I'm only human after all. Pepe after committing the 11th war crime before lunchtime. I'm only human after all.
Let's talk about something somehow even more depressing. Right outside the Waterfront District, not to be confused with the Cloud District, which is an entirely different realm of hell, there is a woman named Martha who is blind and wants us to help her find the tombs of her family members. I'm looking for my family's graves, but I can't find them. The names on them are Johan, Simon, and Klaas. Her family is actually buried on the other side of the map, in a place called Chapel of Arcade Cemetery. There are a bunch of things going on with this place. There is a dead slave trader here, who has been leaving notes for us, all throughout Cold Harbor. Further down the cemetery, we can kill Dirok the Grey and gain access to the Chapel of Arcade. Inside, we can find another Knight of the Nine, Torolf. When we defeat him, we gain access to the Great Sword of Anuel, which reacts with Arcade's body. Is this the corpse of the real Arcade? No, it's a fake. How do we know this? We know this because if you hit Arcade's body with the Great Sword of Anuel, it completely collapses, and instead, it reveals a door to an ossuary. Inside that place, we can find the Black Hand from Act 3 and a banner which reads, Leave the world onto darkness and onto me. You can kill it for some good karma, but if you have the this is desiring, you can actually talk to her to get some exposition. You can also ask to trade with her for some permanent buffs in exchange for karma, but personally, I prefer the exposition. Do you know anything about Laza? What can you tell me about Molak Ball? What do you know about Shazar? I'm a sword hero, a mortal who has reached divinity, a walking tower. No one or name can mind him, and the world bows to his will. In this, I summon the world power. Okay, that was a bit of a long sideshow, back to Martha. Well, when we find the graves of her ancestors, we can interact with them and enter another dream. The dream of Johan. Orke, gold of life and death. We entrust to you Martha, who has finished her life's journey much too soon. Please take away her burdens, lead her to the great Aetherius, and let her into the circle of saints. Grant eternal happiness to us who grieve here, as well as to Martha, who has now passed through the cycle of life and death. Come, let's get back home. It's going to rain. Go ahead, I want to be alone for a while. Bruh. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck, man? Get your ass. Death of a loved one is always a dreadful affair. How cruel R.K. is. Who are you? Just a traveling bard. My name is Bal. Would you like to hear a song? Perhaps the story of Polydor and Eloisa? What do you want? Collect the souls of sinners. As many as you can. Will you do it? If I do it, will my sister come back? Yes, of course. My lord is above Arke's laws. Fine then. Gladly. It was yours from the very beginning, Master Johan. Me when there, me when hungry, me when me and my sister and only one slice of pizza left and we hungry. It's done. We did it. The, the mace. Where is the mace? There! There it is! We did it, brother! We can get whatever we want now! Yes. With this mace, all our dreams can come true. Come on, let's go. Brother, wait for me! Johan, you have served me well. Let's hear your final wish. You want me to burn everything? 
good. As you wish. Everything you have built in your life, everyone you have ever called family, all will be burned to ashes. Now, sleep. You shall have your eternal rest in my realm. Now this is what actually happened, but we can always just talk about to leave and get a better ending and some karma. When we tell Martha about this, she goes to visit the graves of her two brothers, and after two days, she passes away peacefully, finally united with her family, and finally free of Malak Paul's influence. Ah, such a wholesome story. Okay, back to people and their mistakes. Next up we have the story of Marhaus, Alessia, and their son Belhazar. Oh yeah, it's all coming together now. So this is a bit of a weird one. There are four battles with the memories of each Marhaus, Belhazar, Pelanol, and Alessia. We did Pelanol's tower already, so let's move on to Marhaus. Let me show you how Marhaus, son of Kain, makes an appearance. Oh yeah, he can shout. When we release him, we can get his nose ring. And when we interact with his barrier, we get this scene. So you went before me, too. You remained faithful to yourself until the end. You told me once, Pelinol, that Ada changes things through love. This is why my heart feels so heavy. It would be so much easier to surrender myself to bloodlust and rage. But I will keep watch for her, for Paravania. Hey, yo, bro, are you gonna are you gonna eat that broken sword? A few things about this scene you may have missed. In case you need a backstory for Gardner and Thanor, he was once an alien who survived the fall of the Alien Empire, and he's right here. At the end of the line of soldiers, we can also see Maran before he had to go into hiding for worshiping Mara, and Ritho, a giant knight who guards the gate between the Cocoon of Order and the Imperial City. Oh, and then there's this guy. After the storm comes the calm. And with it, the grief. So who is this guy talking about storms and having dragons all over his armor? Oh yeah, it's heading exactly where you think it's heading. And this was Mora House's dream. I now have to give you a small disclaimer. I will now move on to the Tower of Saint Alicia, but in a normal playthrough, this tower only becomes available once you completed all the other towers. However, Belhazar's tower is an entire saga all by itself, and it takes you to a bunch of other places, whereas this one is a lot more linear and serves basically as an epilogue for these characters. So I'm choosing to talk about this one first. Outside this barrier is Sir Amiel, who is the founder of the Knights of the Nine. And this is what happens when we enter Alicia's barrier. And just as a heads up, Alicia isn't voice acted yet. I knew she would go to the stars, but it's still so painful. Paravant will become a star. I will never forget how her eyes burned bright as meteors. Parif? Yes, I did. Finally. I'm going to her now. I'm not sure I will. Yes, perhaps. It's time to say goodbye. Sleep well, Perith. The hair Pelanol is talking about obviously refers to Kine, Kine, Kine. Now, who is this guy? Well, what if I told you that this guy is actually three Shazarins thrown into one? Izmir Wolfarth, Hyolti, and Zeran Arctis. Yes, this is Talos. And he's here because... He's here because he reached Amaranth, and he can be whenever and wherever he wants. And with that revelation out of the way, let's talk about Belhazar's tower. Petition to House Tharn. What are you thinking? Imprisoning Emperor Belhazar? This is treason! That's not Emperor Belhazar, that's just a pathetic minotaur who convinced himself that he's the son of Saint Alicia. Saint Alicia was a cruel woman, to pick up an orphan minotaur child and raise it as her own. It seems she was not aware of just how low the intelligence of minotaurs is. And so, this beast falsely claims that he's the child of Morahouse and Saint Alicia, and has unjustly occupied the throne to this very day. You should be thankful, we aren't simply just gonna execute him. If only this beast was intelligent, whatever his birth, the amulet of kings chose him. This should be the best proof of who he is. Why are you 
pretending otherwise. Are you saying that Saint Alicia opened her legs to a beast and put this deformed monster off her womb? The Alicia we Elysians revere is not some whore consorting with beasts. No, Saint Alicia did not consort with a beast, but with an ancient spirit. The blood of the Ada is unstable as it is. It is something that the state of relief at the time reflected itself strongly on Belhaz's appearance. And it's not that the Elysian Order isn't executing him out of generosity. You cannot execute him. Otherwise, you would lose the protection the Amulet of Kings grants us. According to the official doctrines of the Elysian Order, that beast is a pet Saint Alicia kept. This shall be the truth from now on. We will prepare a new Emperor of Belhazar separately. So it has been decided. The Amulet of Kings will reject him. I implore you, reconsider your decision. We do not choose what refuses to choose us. So we choose our own truth. If belief determines what God is, then we shall fabricate memories. Then we shall fabricate history itself. If the blood of Ara blows through that beast's veins, then so be it. We will test our faith, and we shall dissect and reshape gods with words of our own. We will create a new Emperor of Belhazar, tailored to our wishes, from that beast. People like us cannot create anything. Even if you paint over lies with more lies, the truth will always be revealed. That may be so, but not yet. So there's no problem, is there? We can imagine. We can create. Gods are merely spirits after all, and they must take the forms people believe in. Soon, the demigod Morehouse will fuse into one such form, and when that happens, the horns of Emperor Belhazar will fall off and he will be fully human. Is this why you slaughtered even the friendly Elliots? Because they remember the forms of Saint Elysia, Morehouse and Pelennor. Indeed. Human lives are short compared to the elven ones. Not a single human remembers our heroes anymore. Not even us, but to the elves. They were terror incarnate. The horror was so vivid in their eyes that it became an endless reoccurring nightmare. The very sight of gods was like pain itself. We simply spared them of the nightmares. This is a rebellion. Are you going to rebel even against the gods by slaughtering the elves? Of course not. We will make a god of our own. May what we believe in be what all believe in. Then how are we any different from the aliens of old? Reconsider this. I beg you. There is no difference. There is no difference whatsoever between the races of man, elf, and lesser races. So you finally understand. They are all the same. We are all the same. And that is why we are the only ones that should remain. Is it true that the Elysian Order decided to strip the elven races of their citizenship rights, followed by giants, minotaurs, and other non-human races? It is true, and I agree with this, of course. It's only natural if we follow the doctrines of the Elysian Order. Are you forgetting that they too joined the Rebellion of Saint Elysia and contributed to the creation of this empire? The Rebellion would have failed without their help, no matter how many times Pelennor appeared. And if that had happened, you'd still be living in misery as slaves or even livestock under the yoke of the Elliots. That may be so, but either way, none of them are human. The Elves are wicked and lowly, and the Giants and Minotaurs? They are but beasts. Nay, monsters even. They cannot be allowed to be our neighbors. The ideal of Saint Elysia, the ideal of this very empire, is to unite the many races, to let them develop together. It is to bring peace to the continent, this bloody arena, to build a tower not by peeling corpses in a struggle, but by understanding and diplomacy. This, this should be the ideal of the Elysian Order too. So why do you oppose it? What do you believe in? In the words of Saint Elysia, of course. We believe and follow the 77 doctrines brought to us by the Prophet Maruch. Then why don't you help them keep their citizenship? I told you, they are not human. The Elysian Empire is an empire created by humans and for humans. It belongs neither to the evil elves nor to the deformed inferior races. It belongs to us the people of the empire, and the only people of the empire are us humans. The rest of the races are not humans, none of them. I know of no such statement of the 77 doctrines. All are guilty until proven innocent. Thank the gods for the words of the prophet Maruk. We have no guarantee that the elves and the other races will not harm the human races in the future. We, the Elysian Order, simply wish to protect the lives of our fellow citizens. This is a just defense for the races of man, our holy war. If you truly love our people, then you will understand. I, I don't understand. Then all of us must obey authority. And authority comes from God. Any God. That is why we, the Elysian Order, have created our own God as well. Such is our decision. You must simply follow it. There is no freedom in this. You forget for what purpose Kinareths and Morahos and Perlo to help the human races. There are no coincidences in a God's world. It is all inevitable. There is no such thing as free will. Kinareths' answer to the prayers of Saint Elysia shows us that humans are truly nothing but slaves of the gods. Our mortal lives remain nothing but toys to the gods' whims. And that is why we must free our people from the games of the gods. What are you planning to do? We will set right the wrongdoings of Saint Elysia. We will separate Ariel, the god of those filthy elves, from Akatosh. When that happens, 
the Elven history will dissolve and their race will be extinct. The other non-human lesser races will perish as well, of course. But our heaven lies beyond that, for only in heaven there is freedom. Freedom for the races of man and the races of man alone. The blue star will be able to see and hear only us. After that even the heart of Shazar will be reforged. We shall remake these orbits with artificial flowers and rebel against the world of the gods. We alone will survive. From the conception of Mundus all the way to its death. May this repeat forever. True human heaven. This is insane. You can't possibly do this. Ah, but all the gods are insane. Surely, this world, our Mundus, it is a product of madness. Therefore, we can accomplish it with even more madness. Looks like you're executing even more prisoners not in the list now. I've even heard some of them claim to be part of. Just, uh, what are we executing? You doubt our faith. Can you at least tell me what they were jailed for and where they were from? No one knows who they were or where they came from. But something we do know, that their eyes do not see the truth we want them to see. What greater sin could there be in the eyes of the Elysian Order? I don't understand. I demand an explanation. The prisoner's fate is a grand thing. No one can resist its flow. When they follow the prophecies written in the books of Star and Frost, then such a future will surely come true. No matter how much we dance on the Grandians, they would simply create a world they want, in each and every moment. Isn't that precisely this Shazarin we've been looking for? Why kill them? They do not see us. In return, we refuse to see those who refuse to see us. They're here to save us. How many times do you think you can repel their help? Their salvation would destroy what we've built up through all these years. It will destroy us. That is why we reject them. We don't want that freedom of theirs. All you've built up so far is a pile of corpses. What value do we truly possess? We should be glad to give up our lives, to pay for all this with our very bodies. We require no forgiveness. We require no punishment. We've already decided to reach heaven even if we have to drown all of Nern in a sea of blood and excrement. Isn't that exactly what hell sounds like? No, this is our heaven. We were born with no other choice but to reach it with violence. I disagree. We still have the word. The word we have is God and his love is violence itself. Law, morality, all the other laws, nothing but verbal violence. We mortals are the proof of the folly and the arrogance of gods. And so we wish to make it right. But I still think, give it up my friend, our power and authority certainly comes from the gods, but our rule did not, for all crowns are illuminated by the stone of fire. Such blasphemy. This goes against all the doctrines of Maruch. You keep bringing up these doctrines and refuting me at every opportunity. Yet how many of them do you truly remember? I remember none of them. And yet, I somehow know what to do. At some point, my arms and legs began moving as if they had a mind of their own. No, I, I, I don't remember any of them either. How did I not notice this? This record may remain, but none will remember it. Those who read it and those who wrote it, all will forget it. You saw that cliff on which Maruk drew his doctrines, didn't you? Were those surely the words of St. Alessia? The cliff was covered in blood and Maruk was already dead. The other Imga traced the blood stains on it and gave me their interpretations. On only one image was painted on the cliff, but there were more than 77 interpretations of it. So there was no truth, only interpretation. Uh, but you returned to the Imperial City together with Maruk, and yet, Maruk was supposed to be dead. Do you remember his words when he pointed to the statue of Akatosh? Ariel is not worthy. And then he vomited up a burning stone and turned into a mangled corpse again. That stone chose us, and that which chooses us, we also choose it. I... I was chosen. It chose me. Indeed. We were chosen. It chose us. For those who cannot be free, domination is the only true kindness. So close your eyes, cover your ears, and shut your mouth. Trust is the warmth of the stone, for we must be burnt twice. Before we get inside the tower, I want us to head over to the First Imperial Court, where we can find one of the books I just read to you, along with a headless statue of Belhazar. The statue has an inscription on it, which reads, Belhazar, the son of Saint Alicia and her consort Morehouse, was indeed a man. Blank. Some marks remain where the Elysian Order filled down the letters. What was the word that was removed? Then, when we try to interact with the removed word, we get the following note. Strangely, you cannot think of a single word here. A curse inhabiting memory, placed by the Elysian Order, may be to blame here. Okay, now we can talk about the barrier. When we enter it, we simply get this in. By the way, just to make things clear, Paravania is just another name for Elysia. And now that we have the Bull Elder Scroll, we regain the memory of Belhazar, as he was. Not as the Elysians wanted him to be known. In case anyone was wondering how did Elysia end up in Cold Harbor, by the way, the guardian of this barrier, Baptist Manelion, describes in his note how he was haunted by an unknown voice, which told him to go to San Crator, dig up the body of Saint Elysia, and take it to the White Gold Tower where the fake Arabal was. And now we go back to the statue and say the right word. Belhazar, son of Empress Elysia and her consort Morahouse, 
was indeed a man bull. And now we may finally enter Belhazar's hidden chamber. In it, we find a bunch of tortured militors who have died and have beef in their inventory space, which is very fitting and very immersive, and a bunch of Elysian secret keepers. Further down, we can also find Amigustan, or as the voices in my head have wanted me to pronounce his name all along, Amogustan. When we kill him, we get another one of those books I read earlier, along with access to three star reading wells. Two wells are already filled, and the only one missing is the bull scroll. So we place it down, and we open up a portal to the real top G of the Elysian Empire. A cow. With the amulet of kings on it. We can also pet the cow. Yes. We can then say, here king, you drop this, and give him either his dad's nose ring, or his horn, which was in the possession of his fake self. And with one of these items, he turns back into his normal self. Now, Belhazar is a newer addition to Vigilant, and so he doesn't have a voice actor yet. So, since we're all here already, I would like to petition myself as a potential voice actor for Belhazar. I feel like this would officially fulfill my redemption arc, provide me with a sense of completion, and clean up my resume so I can fill it in the future with more failures and shortcomings. I will now give my best Belhazar impersonation. What are you doing? Writing an imperial degree to all the provinces? Even now, there remain some who serve a foolish leader like me. They are my pride. The wind has changed with your arrival. The winds of Kinareth tell me that there is still something I can do. I understand now why Akatosh sent you to be a witness to this moment. So I'll keep struggling in this little room. I will support you from the shadows of time, your majesty. I am in your debt for all the help you've given me, but I have nothing to repay you with. I will repay you someday though. I will prove to my mother, Alicia, that at least these shred of her ideals will be preserved for the future generations. Made, <clears throat> Jesus, made rich your time. When will you learn? When will you learn that your actions have consequences? Between this and the petitions to House Tharn, my vocal cords will never be the same. Also, there is a white flower and a feather of kind here, which are gonna be needed shortly, so I'm gonna yoink them right here right now. Now it is time to get out of Cold Harbor real quick, to finish Belhazar's story with a bit of a positive note. When we attempt to exit Standard Ravine, we are stopped by a man bull named Mordog, who says that he has been waiting for us because he and his family have inherited Belhazar's last wish. He says that Belhazar's plotline is still missing, but per his will, Mordog has something he wants to show us. And it is a village full of minotaurs, and the chief of this village looks a lot like Belhazar, but he of course assures us that this is merely a similarity. When we ask him if there are any more intelligent minotaurs out there, he says that only a few clans maintain their intelligence, most were hunted down and driven to madness. When we ask him if there is anything we can do to help them right now, he says that we have to find a new king of kings to unite the continent under a new empire, and he also mentions that he heard of a demigod bloodline still wandering the world. However, he notes that even if we find them, they probably won't accept the throne based on bloodline alone. I wonder who they could possibly be. Oh no, for real. I got a bunch of theories in my head, but the more I think about it, the more I realize that out there exist a lot of people created by or possessing the blood of Ada. And that was the true story of Belhazar. And finally, I can now enjoy a full night's sleep. It's been more than a year. Oh, hi, Sacred and Adamant, sir. I didn't even see you there. Okay, before we get back into the difficult topics, aka Janelle's library, the eight saints of Sirot, and this guy, I want to take you all to a tourist store in Cold Harbor and admire some events slash characters present there. Starting with the Waterfront District. Now, did you know that in the Waterfront District, there is a house which houses the actual main villain of the Vision Trilogy? No, not an owl. No, not the guy commanding the owls either, and not the sacred anatomancer either. I am, of course, talking about the more profound evil. Introducing Bandit Kanra. But who is Kanra? I will now give the canon answer to that question. Kanra is Kanra. What kind of evil, mischievous deeds did Kanra do to end up in Cold Harbor? Oh, let me tell ya. Kanra slept late after bedtime. Kanra hit one of our shoes oh to make God. it seem like we lost it. Kanra ate three. Count them three times the permitted dose of daily snacks. Holy mother of God! This is a born monster. In all honesty, it can give good tips in case you get lost or you don't know what to do in Cold Harbor, so it's good to check up on Bandit Khan every now and again. Further down the road, we can see Giovanni's house, which makes sense because he too was killed while holding a piece of ball. So ending up here makes sense. And wait, Marso? Take a good look, kids. This is where being horny gets you. I tried killing him, but apparently doing so loses you karma. So remember the slave trader we found in Arcade Cemetery? Well, in the beginning of our journey inside Cold Harbor, we can lockpick the slave trader's house. Inside, we find one of his notes, along with Sir Hendrik. Oh, are you freeing me? I don't even know what happened that I ended up trapped here. 
What a rotten luck. When we let Sir Henry out, he proceeds to wander around Cold Harbor in search of his missing mates, aka the other Knights of the Nine, at the same time as we do. And so we can find him in a bunch of other locations. We can save him again in Varlas Castle, Imperial Prisons, and Narfin's Inquisition Court. In Varlas Castle, we also get to find Master Chef River Jumper. I feel like, as consumers of video games, we have a lot to learn from the boss design of um, Master Chef River Jumper. But I don't think we're ready and mature enough to have this kind of conversations yet. In Arfin's Inquisition Court, he tells us that there are two other knights of the night on the rooftop, and those knights are Sir Yunkan, who we've already met in the Waterfront District, and Sir Gregory, who has been leaving notes for us all throughout Cold Harbor. He is a friendly, wholesome fella who went on a quest to gaze upon the Bellas Fountain, and he did, but then he was killed by Yunkan, who has gone insane. So we kill Yunkan, and then Henrik says, F this place, I'm out. I'm a good chill and meth melada power if you need me. And from that point onward, he becomes an available follower. Another topic. In an in-game book called Vernagus and Burlor, Vernagus is a lesser danger that shame Burlor, who was the best marksman on Tamriel during his time, by making him miss a shot for the first time ever. Burlor then gets depressed, loses everything, and dies soon after. But then, something something happens, and we figure out that he never actually missed. Vernagus is thus sent back to Cold Harbor. Well, we met Vernagus already. Burlor, however, lives in a house not far away from Vernagus's castle. When we defeat Vernagus, we can give Parlos bow back to him and then he becomes a follower. We also get some free karma. By the way, the guy we killed in Act 1 because he had a red stone in his eye socket is also here. And he hates us, which I believe is completely fair. <laughs> Did the mighty Vigilant also end up in oblivion? What an irony. There's also a witch somewhere around here which sells spells. I, I don't know where to find her, I never watched Harry Potter. But you know who I do like? Melus Petilius. Vena. Ah, Vena. Vena, I'm always with you. Okay, to tell a long story short, in Oblivion, and I mean the game Oblivion, Molak Boss Date Request has us tempting this guy to once again become violent by having him kill us using Molak Boss Mace. The point is that he used to be a paladin of the land, always listening to the call for help and killing whatever he had to in order to protect the realm, but one day, he came back home only to find that his wife died of fever. Since then, he swore off violence and spent all his days meditating at his wife's tomb, like a simp but for a dead person. So because the champion of Cyrodiil corrupted him, he is now stuck in Cold Harbor with the corpse of Vayna, who is definitely not all here. Do you remember our first encounter, Vena? The sky, the, the sky was red, like here. Damn, the new we cannot burn is hits kinda different. So this guy then wanders all around Cold Harbor with Vena's cops on his shoulders until his journey ends at South's channel, in which place he gives us this boss fight. I'm sorry, Vena. It will be a bit noisy again. Yes, it's alright. I'll be right back. Whoa, that is pretty heavy. I'm still gonna loot the bodies though. Okay, before we get into the most sizable content, I wanna get out of Cold Harbor for a moment and talk about the new side quests. They are broken down into two separate categories. Vigilant and Radiant. Vigilant quests give you karma and devotion to standard. These quests can range anywhere from tasks such as killing a chick trader, more on them later, killing a piper, more on them later as well, finding a lost relic, all the way down to taking an erotic book out of circulation because it depicts a venerated character in an explicit way. How explicit? I hear you asking. Explicit in all the wrong ways that can only be conceived inside the brain of a Japanese man, I reply. Radiant quests, on the other hand, are given by the sacred Anadomancer and they give radiance instead of devotion. These quests are bizarre, especially if you don't know who he is. But even if you do, they're still bizarre. Bodies of those trapped in a long dream naturally bear radiance. It feeds on their dreams and grows ever larger. Huh? Every time you look into the mirror, your radiance is doubled and its overflow becomes a person of its own right. Now is the time for cannibalism. Huh? It's not even used as a metaphor. This is a real thing. Keep these quests in mind. The Radiance and the Sacred Anadomancer will be explained later. Before we get into some of the bigger subjects, I want to mention some smaller events that take place inside Cold Harbor, but I couldn't find anywhere else to stick them. So I'm just gonna tie them all together here and call it a section. Remember Bartholo from Act 3? The Vigilant that entered the mansion before us and eventually got corrupted by Molak Paul? Well, he's in the Inquisition called Suez as well. He is completely infected with a Thrashian Plague and he attacks us on sight. Rip. Um, do you know Uncle Bartholo? He promised to play with me, but I can't find him. So, um, who's gonna tell him? On the topic of infected things that can be found in the sewers, I wanna talk about Atima. She can be found right next to Sir Caius outside Mary's boss fight room. She says that she was abused by her former parents, and so she wandered into the sewers where she got the thrash on plague and has been hanging around Caius and Mary's hands. Atima hates her. Atima hates her old father, too. They hurt Atima. Bad child. Bad child, they said. Because Atima is a Khajiit, they made her wear a collar and beat her with the whip. 
Her parents are Count Leed and Countess Tarla, and they can be found in Altar's channel. Tarla has a Tima's pelt, which you can give back to Tima for some free karma and one of her dolls. If I had a dime for every time a Khajiit got skin in this mod, I would have two dimes, which isn't much, but it's weird that it happened twice. On another note, Emperor Goryeo's channel isn't really an essential location, but it features a pretty badass boss fight. Goryeo's is quite an interesting historical figure for the Lesson Empire. Initially, he won a bunch of battles for the Lesson Army and even made some diplomatic progress with the Elven provinces. And by progress, I mean he didn't immediately start calling them slurs. He did, however, lose a great battle against Kingrad, which began the split between Colovia and the rest of Cyrodiil, which eventually turned into the War of Righteousness and the collapse of the Elysian Empire. AK, his defeat marked the beginning of the end for the Elysian Order. Now, above the sewers, in the prison, we can find the best character in all of Cold Harbor, Jezan the Khajiit. Jezan is my boy. No, Jezan is my top G. Yeah, I'm just gonna say it. Jezan is the only fairy that I have any kind of tolerance for. He's the most Khajiit anyone has ever Khajiited. Just listen to how he ended up in prison and then subsequently in Cold Harbor. Jezan was thrown in here because he spat skooma at the Inquisitor. <laughs> Jezan may also be a thief, but he must now endure stinking food in this stinking hole. Why did you do that? Because he was a fool. Those bastards wanted to hang a boy who was saved by Mary. This Khajiit could not allow that. Jezan jumped on the gallows, but he did not think what to do next. So he said his opinion first, and then spat skooma at some people. Those fools did not know what hit them. <laughs> I think that we can all learn something from Jezan. Don't be complacent at the side of atrocities. Instead, speed hardcore drugs at the authorities. Well, Jezan will not be able to get out anytime soon. And there are only a few bottles of skooma left. Jezan's end is near. He on borrowed time though. We can actually find him again after we kill the warden of the prison and make it out of there. Here he gives us the option to buy a strange helmet he found for 100 gold. If we buy the helmet and then walk a bit further down the road, we can find the guy whose helmet this is, only to find out that this is no helmet at all. Rather, it's someone's hair. Sir Ravlas's hair to be exact. I project my voice to my stomach instead of the throat. Like all of us, Dunmer. There is a final activity where we get to place the helmet in his head in the right way, and after that he goes back to Mithmalana Priory and becomes an available companion as well. We can actually find one of Jezan's ancestors right after the end of the main quest of Vigilant. Right after we exit Cold Harbor and wash up in Lake Elnalda, she picks us up and tells us that he saved Kambarera and Giovanni from the Chick Trader. But what is a Chick Trader? A slave trader who sells children. He kidnaps orphans and sells them into slavery. He is the worst among slavers. Even the Renrid Jacqueline do not do such things. Beware of the cat called Jazel. He is especially ruthless, both at buying and selling. Now, Jazel is one of the most essential characters of Glen Moriel, and we will be talking a lot more about him in videos to come. However, since Jazen has brought it up, I want to take one minute to read a book called The Straight Cut of Coral. I think this book showcases the true madness of the Elysians, as well as the birth of one of the most essential characters behind these mods. By the way, this story is written by the Jazan of the Elysian time period, just to be clear. This is the story of a murderous villain who was sentenced to death in the town of Coral in Sirot. The Khajiit named Jazeri was a bastard child. When he was still a kitten, he was abandoned in the mountains and a shepherd from Coral picked him up. The shepherd brought up the kitten, but Jezeri was grown like a wild beast. The shepherd gave no education to the kitten, and when he could walk, he forced Jezeri to chase the sheep like a sheepdog. No matter how rainy or cold it was, Jezeri was barely clothed and hardly got enough food to even survive, and the shepherd felt no guilt or shame for this abuse. On the contrary, he believed that he had the right to treat Jezeri like this, for he found Jezeri left alone like garbage, and so he treated Jezeri as unfit to even eat. Jezeri was desperate to find anything to eat, but he was not allowed even the leftovers of the food for livestock. Once, when he stole some food, the shepherd severely whipped him as punishment. So Jazeri lived a miserable life as a kitten. But when he grew up and his body became strong enough, he ran away from the shepherd. And so he became a thief. So this wild beast earned his keep as a laborer in the town of Coral. He kept living like a rogue. And in the end, he killed an old man and took his belongings. Jazeri was immediately arrested, put on trial, and sentenced to death within the same day. The people of Coral had no sympathy for him. When Jazeri was thrown into the prison, the Alessians, followers of Maruk, and some philanthropists began flocking to this wild beast. In kindness, they taught him to read and write, and even lectured him on the scriptures. As a result, the beast named Jezari finally realized his sins. So Jezari wrote a letter to the court. This one was a worthless rogue, but thanks to you, Alessia shone a light in his heart, he said. Then all the philanthropists in Coral steered. High nobility and educated people suddenly stormed the prison in droves to kiss and embrace Jezari. You are our brother. You have been blessed by Alessia. Jezari wept. Yes, Jezari was saved by her grace. 
when he was a kitten, Jazari was happy to be fed even like a pig. But at last, Jazari has received the grace of Alessia, and he can die in her arms. The philanthropists of Coral then burst into tears. Yes, Jazari, you must die. Those who shed blood must die in the arms of Our Lady Alessia. It is not your fault that you did not know about Alessia, but even so, you should not have shed blood. Therefore, Jazari, you must die. The last day arrived and poor Jazari cried repeatedly. Today is the best day of Jazari's life, because Jazari is going to join Alessia by her side. And the people of Coral said, Yes, this is the happiest day of all, because you are going to join Alessia by her side. The people followed Jazari's courage. Eventually, they reached the execution grounds. Come on, brother, you must die, they screamed at Jazari. Come on, die, for you have received the grace of Alessia. And so, the people who called Jazari their brother beheaded him in their kindness. Oh gee willikers, I sure hope no man called Orlando slaps his head back on for nefarious deeds, foreshadowing, never heard of her. Okay, so that's Jazan and Jazeri. Since we're on the topic of foreshadowing characters and locations from Glen Moriel, let's keep this train up by talking about the dragon Kakangrin. He's a dragon in prison in the Inquisition court, right next to Belhazar's barrier, and his backstory is that he along with a bunch of other dragons abandoned Alduin and decided to chill with Khan instead. Unfortunately for them, an owl, and I'm just gonna say it right now, it was the black owl, cursed them with a blood curse which turned their wings into stone. All of them died, save for him, who the Alessians took as a prisoner because they thought that taming a dragon who can't even fly might look kinda slick. He first asks us to open the rooftop so he can get some fresh air, and when we do that, he then thanks us and asks us to find a white flower, as it kinda reminds him of Kain's garden. There are a bunch of ways of getting said flower, but if you remember, I yoinked one from Belhazar's chamber, so I'll give him that one along with a feather of Kain, and with them, he can finally rest and return back to Kain. There is such beauty in you mortals. My former lord Alduin never understood this. We have failed, but our way was not wrong. Kind still lives in the hearts of the people. Ah, I hear the song of the wind. My friends are calling me. The Song of Kai. I have longed for this. Okay, I will speedrun some quick facts for the sake of completionism, and then we'll get into the important stuff. Okay, go. In Valar Stream, you can head the other way to get another Dawnbreaker, meaning that you can now dual wield Dawnbreakers. The Daedroth at Altano outside the Waterfront District is a reference to a Daedroth from Morrowind, and the Scamblord Duke Kuata is also a reference to the Seventh Sermon of the 26 Sermons of Ivek. Rithor was one of the original warriors of the Elysian Rebellion, who fought beside Pelano, Varla, and Morrowhouse. He also did absolutely nothing wrong to end up here, nor was he sacrificed to the stone. He just loved his comrades so much that he refused to live without them, and so he guards the gate leading up to the Cocoon of Order in order to protect them, hoping that one day they can all move on together. My lord, my friends and my subordinates are here. I can't go to Arthurius without them. He also said that he would attack us if we passed through the gate, but I checked and he doesn't. I understand that this is probably not meant to happen, but I choose to interpret this as him being too sweet to attack us. All around Cold Harbor, there are pierced corpses of Solshurian people that got imprisoned in Cold Harbor by Malak Ball. These are just nice little boss fights like Grand Sam Karma. My personal favorite of these is Messi the Sun, because reasons and everything. <laughs> Okay, enough with the detail work. Let's talk about the important stuff. AK, I will talk. And Sacred Anadomancer. There are two characters I want to showcase before we talk about the Eight Saints of Sirot. Pop Mangus and the Black Worm, aka Menemarko. I'm gonna start with Mangus because we already met him in the main quest. If we kill Archpriest Sentius, we gain access to Pepe's staff, which if we equip well in Mangus's chamber, he does not attack us. Instead, we get the option to talk to him. What is the Golden Egg? The Owl offered it to me. He said a new life will spring from it, if it has brought blood, flesh, and bones. Many believers sacrifice their bodies, but it still won't hatch. Perhaps this treasure of Sarthol is a fake too. But I cannot give up now, not now. Next time, next time. Even though I already know the result. This must be my age showing that I am still hoping for something. Tell me more about Laza. Laza? A barbarian from the north. His is a story of a weak man deceived by the owl. And yet, I cannot laugh at him, for I too have been deceived by the owl. 
there is a bit more context he can give about other topics as well, but we know everything already, so we're just gonna move on. So this egg was given to them by an owl who told them that it was a treasure from Southall and the people gave themselves to it so it can hatch. And I will remind people that the egg is called Janal's egg, and inside it, it contains human hearts and flesh, Maruk's staff and sword, Janal's golden ring, and I'm just gonna say it now, the owl that gave them this egg is Janal the Grey, and it is indeed a fake. And we will see the real treasure of Southall, as well as who this Janal in particular is, shortly. But for now, I wanna mention the Black Worm. The Order of the Black Worm is an organization founded by Menemarco, and this right here is Menemarco. How do we know this? First, use your brain. Second, during the main quest of ESO, Menemarco betrays Molagbol and gets imprisoned in his realm. There he is. When we free him, we can ask him some questions. There is a dragon statue in the main hall leading up to his prison cell, and when we ask him about this, he says this. These are the remains of a dragon the Owl Mage caught. It's the work of ancient magic from the times when it was not yet divided into different schools. It's crude and brutal, and knows no limits or mercy. Blood and flesh is etched in endless, unimaginably painful rituals. It's so unforgivable, even a necromancer would hesitate to use it. It's a dreadful magic. Our mage? Who is he? I heard he was an eccentric mage. He never used any magic himself, but made people around him do what he wanted. So be careful if an owl ever perches on your shoulder and sings to you about luck and glory. If we ask him about the nature of Molak Paul, he gives an interesting answer about human souls. My friend, a soul is everything. A soul is the whole mundus. It can turn oblivion into Aetherius and the other way around. So, what is going on? Who is this owl and what is he up to? Well, let us read The Eight Saints of Cyrodiil, an account of the eight men and women who served and were canonized by the prophet Maruch. The original manuscript was lost during the War of Righteousness, and the following is a compilation of fragments from a manuscript found in Lekil and Alta. Sart, a woman of eternal youth with one red eye and one blue eye. She used to be a handmaiden of Saint Elysia. After Elysia's death, she first served Emperor Belhazar, and then, after the founding of the Elysian Order, she served Prophet Maruch. Thanks to the blessing of Saint Elysia, old age could not touch her, and even at an age of more than 100 years old, she still kept an appearance of a young woman. After Maruk's death, she aged rapidly, as if she suddenly remembered mortality, before finally turning to ash, leaving behind only her jewel-like eyes. Sart's eyes were turned into rings which can be found in her channel, placed on Vayner's body, and her ashes were scattered all over Cold Harbor as a consumable item that gives 10 permanent health per ash consumed. Mura, a great healer born in High Rock. Her true name is Mary. She had possessed exceptional healing powers and cleansed Lake Elinata of the tainted blood of the vampires within a single night. It was said that she was executed after the confrontation with the Elysian Order during the Thracian Plague epidemic. Because of this, her name was erased from the later records of the Alessian Empire. We already talked about Mary, so let's move on. Nenyant, originally a feudal lord, ruling over Eastern Cyrodiil. He was a member of the Marukadi Selective, but was considered very moderate amongst them. He spent his entire fortune to build an underground priory in his territory, but after finding ruins from the Donira, he disappeared along with his friend Manthar. After his disappearance, the seat of the Eastern Lords was given over to a knight named Varla, on the recommendation of Emperor Belhazar. Manthar, he was a sorcerer and architect of the Elysian Order. He was involved in the construction of hundreds of priories, supported by Menion. After completion of the underground priory, he disappeared along with Menion, while exploring the ruins discovered during the construction work. Silon, one of the founders of the Marukali Selective. They say that he saved a drowning baby from the Lake Rumare, just as Maruk's prophecy foretold. He went into the depths of the ancient ruins in search for the missing Menion and Manthar, but after a few days, only his skin returned to the surface. The entire underground priory and the excavated ruins were sealed. Okay, what happened to those three? Well, Mayan is an interesting place. It definitely probably has something to do with Sithis and turning people insane. Abbot Cylon hanged himself and his shadow is roaming the place. Manthor died and now he's a boss fight who looks like this, and he also has Sithis' iron on him, which, if you remember, is used to talk to the Black Hand. Mayon's skeleton, on the other hand, can be found on the floor of this place, in a position that can only suggest that he probably did not go out happy. But I'm not good at reading body language, so I'll let you decide. Caliburn, one of the founders of the Marukali Selective. Even within that sect, he was considered one of the most fanatical. He took the holy body of Maruk to Malala and tried to open a gate to Athirus there, but failed and vanished, along with hundreds of his followers. Pelan, unknown origin. It is said that it was he who found the prophet Maruk deep in the jungles of Kolovia. As Maruk's most trusted servant, he was entrusted with the care of his relics after Maruk's death. Thanks to the blessing of Saint Elysia, his life extended for thousands of years, but his form gradually became less and less human. Pelan is Pepe. And finally, Junal. A mage of Admora. After he was banished from Skyrim, he joined Maruk's Elysian Order. His extensive knowledge of magical runes contributed greatly to Maruk's growing influence in the eastern parts of Cyrodiil. In his last years, he completed a secret arcana called Maruk's Torch, which could burn down an entire city, but was exiled from the Elysian Order 
when he refused to share this sacred art with the Alessians. After Jenna's death, the knowledge of his arcana was passed to his most trusted disciple, Cosmas. However, to regain the trust of the Alessians, Cosmas used the arcana to cleanse several cities, including Malada and Pelun. Since Jenna was expelled, the name of his disciple Cosmas was used in the later records of the Elysian Empire. We can actually find Jenna's body in Malada, hidden inside a secret chamber. In his body, we can find a silver ring, a bone of his who by the way are also collectibles that increase magicka, the key to his library, and most importantly, the beaker of Magnus, which is the actual treasure he stole from Southall. Okay, this guy's story is starting to become a lot clearer, but trust me, even with everything that will be said throughout this video about this guy, and a lot will, we will only have covered only like... Eh, maybe like 10% of his story. But for now, I want us to go to the old Temple of the Eight, because there we can find and fight Sir Casimir. And behind him is a prayer hall. Inside said prayer hall is both Sir Perig and Sir Casimir's body, which stores in it the Arcana of Janal. That name sounds familiar. A mage who was later absorbed into the image of God Julianos of the Nine Divines. But he was a pretty poor student when it came to this flame. He stole and spread knowledge of Sarfall without a second thought. By doing this, he did more damage than even Sirabe. What is the flame in the middle of the room? It's a fire ruin. One of the wisdoms of Magnus that Juno stole from Sarfall. It is, in a way, a piece of the sun. It will burn forever. They say Juno tried to drag down Magnus, but he failed. There is no limit to the arrogance of people. They never learn. Even when the cities are reduced to ashes, Juno the Philosopher is no exception. Why did the Knights of the Night end up here? Each of us had a piece of our soul stolen by Molag Ball when we died. We will never know the true peace, and our souls will never reach Aetherius. We can ask him to become our follower, he says yes if we have enough karma, and then he goes to Methmalada Priory to join the other two. Janal's disciple Cosmas is also found in the main quest right by the entrance to Melara, and he carries Magnus's return ring with him. In a rare occurrence, Pepe appears and has some extra words to say about him. What a revolting sight this hero of Melara became. Look at him, and remember how this man ended up. Someday, the same will happen to you. And until someone kills you, you will wander this wasteland endlessly. Whoa, Pepe, that is very insightful commentary you have there. If only it wasn't coming from the same person responsible for all this. Before we enter the library of Junal, I want us to talk about Saklas the Manape. He's a Thalmor agent sent to investigate Cold Harbor, but in reality, he's just using Thalmor resources to analyze Talos and undo his divinity. Sounds like Thalmor propaganda to me, but okay. To that end, he notes how unusual and consistently recurring the name Junal is, saying that it's just the name of a Nordic deity that represented Julianos in the Nordic pantheon. He says that if we ever gain access to his library, which we now have, we should tell him about because he wants to see it with his own eyes. The part where he mentions that the name Junal is everywhere is 100% true by the way. They are collectibles like his bones, but also dragon soul stones, which he created by tricking dragons by trapping their souls in there for research. And when we enter his library, we get to meet him in person. Or well, I'm gonna be honest with you, this isn't really Junal. This is a part of Junal the Grey, and I'm gonna call him Junal the Grey, because, although I haven't introduced the other two, this is who he really is. And he was once one of the saints of Siroth who stole the treasure from Sarthal. The real Gerald the Grey isn't there. What we're seeing here are a few dead pieces of Gerald the Grey, which is why they aren't even humanoid. Instead, they appear as these deformed tumors. What's with the petrified dragon? I tried to snatch their souls, but they closed themselves from me. The secret art of flesh does not seem to work very well on dragons. I thought I could become a dragon if I gained a dragon soul, but I failed. A soul needs a suitable vessel for it, and I lack it. Why are you so obsessed with dragons? It's disturbing. For a hermit like me, dragons are the ultimate desire. I long to be like them. I always wanted to soar in the skies like them. It may be a ridiculous dream, but no matter how many years pass me by, I cannot stop wishing for it to come true. You must know something about Laza. The name brings back memories. He had no magical talent, but he was so wonderfully obedient. So simple as the mind of a shepherd. Because of him, I was able to catch a lot of dragons. I'm very grateful to him. Tell me about the Black Worm. A very clever man, but arrogant and with a twisted mind. He's difficult to handle. 
I tried to interest him in some secret experiments, but instead he used me as a test subject. I was torn to pieces. It took several hundred years for me to reach this size. What do you know about the Black Souls? They are the essence of men, elves, and the Hist. Lower beasts and animals lack them, and any mortal who loses his becomes a beast. I call this the Will to Shazar. It is a steep road, and very few can ever reach Shazar. Most souls get corrupted and return to Father Sithis, like Molag Bal. I was debating with myself whether I should give a timeline for Janal here, but given that even with the things we know, we still have very little information about him provided by Vigilant, and I don't feel like spawning the other two mods here, I will leave him as is and I will come back to him later when we talk about the other mods. We also find Cyclas the Ape-Man here, and uh... Wait, Cyclas, what is that piece of paper beside you? What have you been reading? Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful the truth really is. What truth? I am, and I am not. I am nothing, and I will dissolve into God's dream. Oh no, he got Dwemer pilled. And that is the ideal segue into the final topic of this video, the Sacred Anodomancer. You see, when we were talking about the Waterfront District, I skipped a single house, the Odd Well, and inside of it is the Sacred Anodomancer. If you talk to him before you finish the main quest inside Cold Harbor, you can ask him for a way out of here. To which he responds, an easy one, simply renounce your name, become nameless. One with chaos. Even Molak Paul's eyes can be fooled. But be aware, no one will be able to distinguish you from the other nameless ones. And even if there was such a person, they'd be dazzled by your radiance. What do you say? Do you still want to do this? Will you crawl through the darkness with us? To which we can reply, Fine, I swear this by multiples of three. To which he responds, Love I and we. True God. Play the pipe for this one. Now we're sent back to Skyrim without finishing Vigilant and without finding Molak Paul. Which is something impossible otherwise, unless you're using console commands. Yes, this is an ending. Of sorts, it definitely isn't one of the good ones. Sure, nothing obvious changes. We spawn inside a dungeon room in good old Vigilant HQ, where this guy's kept prisoner. But a bunch of people in Vanilla Skyrim apparently have been <coughs> dazzled by the radiance, meaning they now look like this. Ew. Basically, maggot people. We can confront him about this and tell him, some people that are close to me turn into giant maggots. To which he responds, this is a consequence of your choice. You are the one who wanted the world to be as it is now. I want them to go back to normal. Can I do that? You're acting like a child. A simpleton even. But that's fine. It's easy. All you need to do is get your name back. Oh, maggot. Find the one who picked up your discarded name. For Radiance lies in the guts. Always. So we find the person that has our name and we pickpocket it from them. And it looks like this. When we do so, we're sent back to Cot Harbor and we pick up from where we left on from the point we gave up our name. Here we can also ask him how come he's here, to which he responds. What a strange question. We've always been here. We're still locked in the temple's dungeon, and we're still praying on the Piper's Hill. You are in Cold Harbor, and yet Cold Harbor also resides within you at the same time. Back at the Vigilance dungeon, we can also ask him a bunch of other questions as well. Is there anything I can do to help you? Hunt. Simply hunt. Unleash the radiance of life trapped in your prey. What do you and the Pipers even want? The original love, that cannot even be separated into mere names. The son of the Dreadlord's Pipe shall guide us to the one of the threes. One last note. Right beside him is a report on the Sacred Anadamancer, which reads, The Sacred Anadamancer was a simple fisher that lived in a fishing village by the Lake Ilinalta, until one day he lost his mind and slaughtered his own family. After that, he fled to Riften and disappeared into the railway, only to reappear in the winter of the 198th year of the Fourth Era. He started swearing vigilance from all over the world to his sight, and began organizing a splinter group called the Society of the Holy Pipers. They began kidnapping and torturing innocent people, harvesting their guts and organs to create evil works of art reminiscent of the Elliot Flesh Art. We've been working with the other followers of Stendar on all fronts to defeat this organization, and yet the numbers of the Holy Pipers is not only not decreasing, but it even appears to be growing with each day. Even Stranger, who already defeated dozens of the same Anadomancer, who must be somehow splitting himself into different copies, and these keep reappearing as if there is no end to them. His power must be the result of a contract with the Daedric Prince, but we still don't know which Daedra we're dealing with, so we cannot take effective countermeasures. The only thing we know at the moment is that the new Anadomancer will not appear unless we kill him. I know this is just postponing the problem, but for now, I've imprisoned him here. No one is to approach this prisoner. There is no need to ever fear him. We know that he has no organs left. He is quite literally hollow, and somehow he still lives. I have debated with myself about what would be the ideal way to reveal who this guy is, but I realized that to fully explain to you who he is, I would have to completely spoil the ending of Glen Moriel. And so I cannot tell you who he is, but I can tell you what he is. But to do even that, I need to explain something else. We have spent a lot of time talking about Vigilant in the overall trilogy between this video and the original video that I made last year. And there is a piece of information that I consider to be essential to understand these mods. And it is one that I haven't talked about so far. So I'm here to tell you that the recent trilogy is a core 
work through and through. Right now, the influence of the Kora might not be too impactful, but trust me, by the end of Unslad, we'll be referencing all kinds of Kora tropes. Scarabs and Numer and Landfalls and Jubas that may or may not be a reference to another character if you spell the name as if you were dyslexic. Now, according to the Kora, the key to gaining Amaranth is through love. Love of all and love of the self. Or if you want to put it that way, love, I, and we. And here's where I come to tell you that the Sacred Anadamancer is a false dreamer, someone who thinks of himself as the true Godhead. He is all and all is he, aka he's a Sharmat, much like Degother. But believe me, this guy is, on a good day, approximately about a thousand times worse than Degother, because he's a Sharmat according to the rules of the Kora. And where love may be defined as the affliction of good and the elevation of suffering for the sake of spreading good and ridding the world of suffering, this guy defines love as the polar opposite, which is the affliction of suffering as far and wide as possible for the sake of suffering. I'm also gonna tell you that he was born from someone's guts, which is why he craves them so much. Though whose guts he comes from, I'm not gonna tell you. Yet if you played the epilogue of Vigilan, I bet you can tell by now. When we interact with the Eye of Maruk, it informs us that Radiance is the dream's awakening which can dazzle and erase names. Radiance is anti Jim, and the Pipers are to the second Anadamancer what the dreamers were to Dagother during Test 3. Shamans have this view of themselves as gods coming to take control of what is rightfully theirs, which is of course existence itself. But where Dagother would simply rest with conquering the continent and existing as a new living god, the second Anadamancer was to infest the world and end it entirely, a goal which he defines as the ultimate act of love, basically mercy killing. And that is the story of the second and another one sir and those were the tales from cold harbor if you enjoyed this video and made it this long thank you means a lot i want to extend an open invitation to whoever made it this far into the video and feels like i got something wrong or wants to add something about a topic i mentioned or even wants to talk about a topic i didn't even mention in general the invitation says the comment section is your heaven i often either pin comments of the morothers themselves explaining their own mods or a comment by someone spitting facts so if you have facts spit them down below i understand that many of you might not be pleased about the fact that i didn't explain topics like junal the sacred another one sir and the epilogue which i completely skip for now because it might as well be a glenmore request that has nothing to do with vigilant besides some references at the start. I also know that people are dying to hear an explanation about the past true origins, Lazar's escapades with the owls, as well as who the owls are in general, from someone who is an Aylar, writing paragraphs as responses to questions on Reddit. Massive shoutouts by the way, those answers clear a lot of things in my head. But alas, we must be patient, for when the time comes, the videos will come as well, and who knows what might come sooner, am I right? Now, if all of you would excuse me for a moment, I stumbled upon a white owl the other day, and he was kind enough to give me a key of waiting. I was like, oh my god, he's so kind. He knows that I'm waiting for the mods to be over, so so he gave me a key to end the waiting early. So right now, I'm gonna dive headfirst into that well and find exactly what's behind that door. See you soon everyone!